This is Toyota's worst engine ever made, according to people. This engine has one problem that caused it to earn this name, and in this video, we're going to take this engine out of this car, and we're going to try to fix that problem, and that problem is oil consumption. These things burn oil like you would not believe, but let's get to work, let's start pulling this engine out, and we'll talk about it some more. Well, hello again and welcome. And if you've been watching this style video on my channels, we always ask you to get popcorn. I think we're getting tired of popcorn. Let's get some nachos. If you're new to the, to the style videos, you can get some popcorn if you want. Let's start with the 2AZFE or the FXE because that's for the hybrid models that are affected. So first, let's talk about the history of this engine. This engine is a 2.4 liter four cylinder, beautiful engine, gets good gas mileage, quiet, runs good, has decent power for the cars there is in. So this engine came out in 2002, debuted in the 2002 Toyota Camry. And for the first couple years, it actually had a kind of a birth problem. The bolts in the, the, the cylinder head bolts pull, tend to pull the thread out of the block if you overheat the engine. Now, the debate goes on on this, that this could be an issue for manufacturing and whatnot, but in reality, there are a lot of people who will attest, and please do comment, that will have a 2002 model Camry that never had issues. Basically, you overheat this engine once it's done if you own a 2002 to 2004 model. It'll pull the threads, and there is a repair kit, but it just never really works. And that was it. But then in 2005, 2006, model Camrys and other models that had it, it was great. Didn't burn oil. You don't maintain it right. It's going to burn oil because you didn't maintain it right. But then come 2007. Exception is the RAV4 in the 2006 model, but everything else, 2007. They did an update, and really the update was to kind of bring this engine more in compliance with emissions and whatnot. They did two changes. They changed the, the piston rings to low tension rings. This is where the real problem started, because this was kind of a mid-engine cycle refresh, which usually is, good, is a good thing that solves the problems. But in this case, they tried to keep this engine longer. Low tension rings came about and that's what really earned this engine the uh, worst Toyota engine it's really not the worst Toyota engine I think it's actually one of the greatest ones except with this problem but here is what happened here's how you distinguish the updated low tension ring engine from the non the older one not only not only by the years if you're buying a used engine and whatnot but if the oil cap says 0 20 or 5w20 oil that's the updated one because the previous one said 5w30 well here are the models that actually had the affected engine with the problem with the oil consumption let's start the list 2007 2011 camry hybrid which for the exception of different pistons is exactly the same repair as you see here 2007 2009 toyota camry four cylinder 2009 2011 corolla XRS, and I know we said this is a 2012 Corolla XRS, but this is actually a Canadian model, which went on a little bit longer than the U.S. model. 2009 to 2013 Matrix with the 2AZ engine, also not the standard Matrix. 2006 to 2008 Toyota RAV4. RAV4 got updated in 2006 for the new generation, so it got that engine as well. And then 2007-2008 Solara. Then on the Lexus side, the HS250H. And then on the Scion, some Scions were affected by this. 2007-2009 Scion TC, not the previous year's TC because that's when it actually got the new low tension ring engine. And then 2008 to 2015 Scion XB. Now, 
not to get into politics and courts and whatnot, but uh, one thing led to another, and actually Toyota issued a campaign or a customer support program, they call it, to fix this engine for this particular problem. They admitted there was a problem, people were complaining, Toyota usually likes to make things right for their customers, and they did. That's how I gained experience. There was a eight-month period of my career at Toyota with the dealership that that's all we did, day in, day out, start the day, start the week, start the month. That's all we did. Two AZ re-rings, we called them. So Toyota extended, extended the warranty on this engine. Three years from when the thing started, regardless of the miles, you're gonna take care, they're going to take care of you. Basically, it has to burn more than a quart in 1,000 miles or 1,200 miles, somewhere around there. If it does, it qualifies, and there we go. This is actually a DIY job, believe it or not. This will stand out to some as, what are you talking about? This engine is actually one of the easiest engines to work on in Toyota land. If this engine is difficult, everything else will be a lot more difficult because this engine is so simple, so friendly, timing it is simple, taking it apart simple, doesn't have a lot of parts, it's so well engineered, it's, it's just a joy to work on. The notable, extremely hard models to pull this engine out of, probably in this exact order, is going to be the Scion TC manual transmission. You have to pull the engine and transmission together because there's just simply not enough room in the car. The second one is a Scion TC automatic, very tight, very difficult. And then the third hardest one is this one in the Corolla and equally in the Matrix. Very tight. You have to remove a lot from the front of the engine just to make room to pull the engine out. It's very, very tight. And then the easiest one possibly, in my opinion, is the RAV4. Super simple to pull it out. Camry comes next. Camry has power steering. So you have the power steering pump. You have all the other stuff. That makes it a little bit more difficult. But all of them really are not difficult. The hybrids are a little tricky, but not really that hard. This is not a very difficult job. It's not super labor intensive. Toward the end of the video, we'll talk about costs and whatnot in case you have this issue in your car and you consider repairing it. But here you see we're battling the engine to get it out. This is the part of the Corolla. In any other model, you just pull it right out. But here we're battling it a little bit. And this car was very rusty. It's from Canada. We'll talk about it in a little bit. I'll show you. But it was very difficult to deal with. There were some casualties. I'll show you in a bit. But this is potentially a DIY job. You can actually pull one of these in a Camry without a lift. It's very simple. There's a few things underneath it, and that's that. There's not really a lot to it. Let's check it out. Let's, I'll show you the engine. I'll show you the rust and the casualties, and then we'll continue our conversation. Well, this is the 2AZ FE. And you notice it's a white 2AZ FE. Like I told you, this is a Canadian car. It is unbelievable the amount of rust and oxidation on this engine. I mean, just look at this. This is just unbelievable. There's a lot of corrosion on this car. We had some victims. This was not a simple job, folks. In the Corolla, it is not a simple job to begin with. But this, being as rusty as it is, it is even worse. My hat goes out to Canadian mechanics that have to deal with every single day because this is not really that old of a car. It's 10 years old and it already has this much rust on bolts and stuff, not really on the body and everything. It's been undercoated. But the first victim is the bolt for the compressor. That snapped right off. So we're going to have to deal with that to extract it. This is, I've never seen one of these break, but this one did. It's completely seized. The block drain is completely seized. We didn't even touch that. And then uh, the bolt that usually breaks on these, the one that goes all the way in the back, that was very hard to come out, but it did come out intact. We didn't put a bolt there to hold the engine because we don't want to mangle the threads. We have to clean them up before we put the engine back in the car. This was extremely difficult, and to give you kind of an idea of time, we started at 9 o'clock in the morning. It is 2 o'clock. This took way too long. Usually two hours, this engine is out on the ground. This took a lot longer because it was a Corolla and because things are rusty. We had to really take our time. The plan is here. We're going to 
tear this down completely. We're going to take all the pistons and then right there I'm going to show you why these engines burn oil and what are we going to do to fix it. So without further ado, let's put you guys back on the time lapse. Let's tear this entire engine apart and continue talking. If you're considering doing this job DIY, there's actually not a many special tools on this engine, with the exception of one, maybe two, for this specific job. The head bolts are this special 10 millimeter, 12 point double hex bit. You can find them on Amazon, you can find them anywhere for a few bucks. And then you will need something to compress the piston rings. You'll see the tool that I'm using, but that's really it. The rest is just basic hand tools. Lots of patience and somewhat experience pulling this engine. This is not a super difficult job. It is labor intensive, of course. You're pulling an engine out of a car. Rusty cars will equal things and casualties that things that break, things that seize, fights. But once you get the engine out of the car, I think you are in the clear. You just you want to follow the manual. You want to do things slowly. When you get to the part where we actually do the repair, which you're going to see, there's a few things which I intentionally left full and live in this video in case you're following this to do this DIY. This is perhaps not the specialist, specialist job because this engine is very forgiving with timing, very forgiving with a lot of things. We're going to talk about a few pointers once we get to the part where we actually talk about, assemble it. I'll share with you some things that you should not do to this that I see a lot of people do. Many people will ask, well, how do I know if this engine was done already by that campaign? Like you say you're looking to buy one. You got to either ask the history, go ask at the dealership, give them the VIN. They may be able to tell you. Or there is a telltale sign from the sealer. If you see the sealer is all black across the entire engine, this is potentially an engine that was repaired. See, the original sealer from Toyota from the factory is gray. If you see black sealer everywhere on this engine, this engine was not notorious to leak from the lower oil pan. It was only notorious to leak from the front cover. So if you see black sealer on the front cover, but not on the lower oil pan, or sorry, the upper oil pan, that, in a, that is an engine that has not been done. And pretty soon, you're going to see me pull that lower oil upper oil pan so we flip it there it is that's the part we're removing right now that is the upper oil pan which has the balance shaft as well if that part has gray sealer this engine is from the factory if that part has black sealer there's a very high chance this was actually done at a dealership and in that case if you're looking to buy a car like that you should not have issues because once this is done and the car is maintained afterwards these did not burn oil anymore and this is actually the updated better version of this engine that doesn't have the threads pulling out of the block and whatnot as long as you don't severely overheat it but there you have it let's talk about some pointers in case you're doing this diy or you want to show it to your mechanic who's doing this some pointers on actual assembly for this engine so we came to this point everything's torn apart let's talk about the problem with the 2az problem is right here these are low tension rings and if you look at this set of rings these move this one moves second one moves third one just nothing it's completely seized the reason for that is they don't have as much openings in the back and kind of the whole design of the piston is just not a great idea. This is meant for non-low tension rings, and these are low tension rings. I mean, you'll see how, it, if you've watched people assemble engines on YouTube or whatnot, or you've done this, you know that you can't just expand a ring and put it on. But you're going to see me do that because they're super easy to put on. But something as a testimony to Toyota quality, this engine comes to us from 2002. This is when this engine debuted. This engine has 140,000 miles by the looks of everything. Hasn't had the ideal oil change intervals. You can see all the varnish everywhere. But would you just look at the rod bearings? Would you look at this beautiful 
rod bearing. Folks, this is how a brand new rod bearing looks like. I mean, in engines that run low in oil, this is the first thing that gets wiped. And if you are in BMW land, they just like to get wiped for no reason. Actually, in some BMWs, this is a maintenance item. Here we are, 140,000 miles, Toyota engine, daily driven car, not the greatest oil change history by the previous owners. And we have beautiful rod bearings. Nothing, not even scratch, nothing. And that's how all of them are. And that's how the crank journals are. And that's how the crosshatch on the cylinder walls are. There's just nothing, not even a single scratch, not a single shadow, nothing. Nothing on this one, nothing on this one. It just looks brand spanking new. And this is how this engine is. It's a really good engine. People call it the worst engine because it burns oil. Well, there's a kit to fix this. The problem is the piston and the ring design, but everything else will last three, 400,000 miles, probably more if you take care of it. So let me show you the official kit from Toyota. These are four brand new pistons, and this is the kit. This kit not only has the new updated rings, it actually has everything you need to do this job. Head gasket, they don't give you all the extra stuff that you don't need. They just give you what they need, including, these are the lock pins for the rod pins. And then something very important, new piston jets. And these are different than the old ones. They're a different diameter and they work better. So here's what we're gonna do here. I'm gonna assemble one piston and you're gonna see that how this kinda happens and how simple this is. But before we do that, I wanna talk to you about the pistons. Here's a brand new piston, updated piston. This is not the same piston you would find in the parts catalog. And I'll leave the part numbers if you're interested. Toyota pistons has a number, a letter on them. This one is a B piston. There's an A and a B and a C. Now let's leave this for a second. Let's come here and look at our rod for a second. If you look at the side of the rod, we have B, U, two. The U means nothing. The B is actually what this piston is. And more importantly, what this rod is. And better yet, what this pin is. The two is the number on the bearing. If you flip these rod bearings, you're gonna see a number printed on them and it's also stamped here. It's just for oil clearance. We're gonna double check that everything's within tolerance, but we're not gonna change rod bearings because it would be a waste. These rod bearings are basically brand new. Some people will say, well, why don't you just throw new ones? Why would I throw my customer's money away? There's no point. That's the point here. We're working on Toyotas, folks, not some BMW that blows up every 100,000 miles. But the reason there is ABC, and this is the confusion, it's not really the piston. People assume it's standard size and oversized one. It's not. They're all the same. There is no oversizing this block. This block is a one-time use and it lasts a very long time. But the difference is the clearance between the rod and the wrist pin. That's it. So if you get to a point where you have a B piston and you want to replace it with an A for whatever reason, you're going to change the rod and the pin to an A rod and an A pin. That's it, that's all this is, there's no three sizes. A lot of people have said there is standard size, use the B and then A is, there's no such thing. B is the most common size. That's the one, 90% of them. Very few of them will have mixed in one A, maybe one C. In my entire career, I've done hundreds of these, if not thousands. I've only seen one engine that had two A's and two C's that didn't have any Bs. Majority of them Bs. This one, all four of them are Bs. Let's pull the piston apart. Now I'm gonna do this live. 
gonna take a little bit of time, but we're gonna do this live so you can see the entire process. And this is the official procedure to assemble this piston and these rings. First, you gotta remove the lock pin. Here is one. These are being discarded. We are not reusing these. There we go. This is going to the garbage. There is nothing, nothing reusable here. This is just scrap aluminum. This, however, is not. We are reusing this. And here is how this process starts. We're gonna get our new piston, two lock rings, Put one lock ring in here. There we go. Now we're going to start our pin before we do. Give it a little bit of oil. This is not assembly loop. This is just 5W30 Toyota oil from the bottle. One thing you got to watch for these, there's a dot on the face of the piston. This face is the front of the engine. On here, you have a little notch, two notches actually. These also face the front of the engine. So we're gonna put these notches where this dot is, and then I'm gonna give it a whirl. All right, this is moving freely. Put our second lock pin. Make sure these are free. Everything's moving. That's it. It's as simple as that. Then you get your, your rings. First you have your oil ring number, compression ring number one, which is this one. These do have a paint mark that you got to keep on the right side of the piston when you're looking at it straight. This is not gonna make sense on video, but that's how these are. The second con uh, control ring, the second compression ring does have a marking on it which faces up. Then the new problem solver, the oil control ring, which is now not a single piece, it is three pieces. You have the springs and then the very thin rings that one at the top of the spring one at the bottom this is the best way i found through experience doing a lot of these to start putting your rings the rings will have markings your markings always on the right side you're going to start with the piston in the forward position where you see the notch right here i'm going to put my first ring underneath the land then put my spring Spring is very tricky and it has to go in a specific way. Basically the open end of the spring goes down and the paint mark will be on the left on this one. I usually put it on the side, the opening. Right here. Then you put your lower ring on, make sure it's seated, good. Now that your gap is in front of you, you're gonna flip the piston this is just to stagger your, your ring gaps and not have any issues. Flip the right side. There we go. That's a control ring on. Now my gap is here. I'm going to flip the piston. I'm going to put control ring we're gonna put the comp second compression ring, which does have a mark, it's really hard to see. It's like a lettering on it. That's gonna go up. So we're gonna put this on. Then we're gonna flip this and put the last one on, paint mark on the right side. There we go. That's it. That's one piston assembled. 
Let's install this in the cylinder so you can see this whole process because there's actually a special tool that really works. So this is the special tool I'm going to use for this. This is a piston ring compressor. Very, very simple. Starts narrow at the top and then it gets tighter to where it's the same size. These are from Wysicle, I think they're called. They're a piston manufacturer. This is the size of this piston, 88.5. This kind of cuts the guessing work and everything. You're going to put a little bit of oil in the tool, a little bit of oil here. And then a little bit of oil on your cylinder. But before we do that, there's actually something important that we got to do to this block first. Let's spin the block and I'll show you. There's the oil jets that sit right here. We got to remove them and replace them. Those right there, there's one, there's two, three, and four. So let me, let me replace these real quick. And look, Toyota gave you a little compartment here just to put the bolts in. I usually put them right there. Best tool to remove them is needle nose pliers. There's one. These are garbage, so there goes that. Get the new ones, same way. Just throw them with a needle nose plier and get them right in position. Let's run the bolts down and we'll torque them down. These love to strip, so be careful. You don't want to just run this one down with a gun. And they are 62 inch pound, that's foot pound. We got that taken care of, our crank in the down position, so the piston wouldn't hit it when we install it. Take our rod cap, put a little bit of oil here. And double check one more time that our ring gaps are good. There we go. We're going to install the piston in this tool just like so. There we go. And here's how this goes. That's it. Simple as that. This tool works really good. Fortunately, if you do all kinds of different engines, you're going to have to buy one for every size, but this is a common job for us, so we have that tool. One thing you note before you flip your engine around, you got to make sure everything's facing the right direction. Been there, done that, where you put everything together, then you look, it's backwards. So you got to take it all apart. The dot on the piston have to face the front of the engine all the time. This dot right here has to face the front of the engine. Now we're going to flip it. Get our rod situated and you'll see that this only goes one way, not two ways. Put a little bit of oil. These have pins. Rod cap also have pins. You're going to install this till the pins click and your mark is also facing towards the front of the engine. This means that your rod is also facing the right direction. You're going to put your bolts. These are 18 foot pound and 90 degrees. I do one piston at a time. I see people do all four at the same time. 
do work with one piston at a time because that's how mistakes happen. Plus, if your engine locks up after you put one piston, and if you put all four, you don't know which one you did. So I usually do one of them at a time. This is a 18. Double check it. Do the 90 degrees on the awesome snap-on torque wrench. You can just mark it if you don't have the awesome torque wrench. There's 90 degrees. There's where you can kind of see your 90 degrees. There we go. That's it. This rod is ready for another 300,000 miles. But your engine needs to turn very smoothly. If any one of them you put, it just locks up or it's really tight to turn, go back. Something went south. Either you're, and I'll tell you exactly what usually goes south. Your rod bearing moved and it kind of got jammed. Fortunately, at that point, you destroyed it, but that's how it is. One more thing I will tell you. When this repair was done under warranty, that's it. You did not clean anything. You did not do anything else. You put the pistons and rings. If you need rod bearings, you put rod bearings. And that's it. You are not going to do anything else. But in our case, because something that is also common with this engine, we're going to put valve guide seals. We're also going to give the head a little bit of clean, kind of clean the valves, get some of the carbon off of them and check the valve clearance, give the head a good wash, valve lap the valves if they seem carboned up too bad, and really that's it. Some people will stop right now and go, what about the mains? What about this and that? Folks, we're working on Toyotas. I see people send this engine, send this block, send the cylinder head to the machine shop. Nothing against machine shops. But these blocks and these cylinder heads, they do not have tolerances. This cylinder head, you're technically supposed to not resurface it because it is a VVTi engine. When you resurface cylinder heads, you bring the cams closer. You surface it too much and you resurface the block. You actually could put this engine out of time. Little departure from our 350VH small block Chevy, right? These engines are high tolerance, folks. They have been high tolerance for a long time. They just do not mess with things. Don't change dimensions. The less you do, the better with these engines. Don't go resurfacing a cylinder head that doesn't need it. Don't go replacing rod bearings that don't need it. Don't go polishing a crank that doesn't need it. Don't actually take the crank out if you don't need it. Now, the mains here are good. Don't go too crazy with cleaning the block. Some people will want to shine this block on the inside so it looks beautiful. A couple oil changes and this will look new. That's the reality here. We're gonna do very light cleaning here. We're not gonna go crazy and start shining up the rods. Don't mishandle these parts. Brake clean doesn't work very well with these. You do not want to load them up with brake clean. You want to disturb as little as possible because otherwise, other than the oil burning, this is a perfectly healthy, perfectly smooth running engine. And that's the way it was intended. So having said that, let's time lapse you through the rest. We'll assemble everything. You'll see the head cleaning, some of it. And when we get this thing back together, we'll have a talk for we'll put it back in the car. Let's talk about the cost of this shop. So in case you have this issue with your car, so you can get an idea where this stands. The total cost for this job was right around $3,200 or $3,200. So the labor, labor will vary based on which model this is. But in this case, we were sitting right around 18 hours. If you have a camera wrap for it, it's going to be less. If you have a Cyan TC with a manual transmission, this is going to be higher because that's the most difficult one. The engine repair kit, the one that you've seen me use in this video, was right around 400 bucks. The pistons sit just over $60 each. There's four of them. Toyota coolant, right around $28. We have two gallons. Sealer, right around 20 bucks. Oil filters, and we actually use two oil filters. We'll talk about it toward the end of the video, but I do 
run the car for an hour, do another oil change, just to make sure all debris, anything that's left out is gone. Oil, we have eight quarts of 5W30. That's the oil you do want to use in this case. We also put new spark plugs. We put intake and exhaust valve guide seals. Those were right around 200 bucks. Sorry, the spark plugs were right around 10 bucks each. And the oil filter is 569 as of the date of filming this video. This is a Toyota original F1 filter. Water pump, right around 130 bucks. Water pump is highly recommended for this engine. This is one of their Achilles heels. They kind of love to chew up water pumps. So this is something you want to put unless it was recently replaced. And a drive bell for 45 bucks. Not a bad job. It is high cost. And this is how you come to this decision. When you're faced with a big bill on your car, you gotta not look at what the bill is, look at the rest of the car. Is this worth it? In this case, the transmission was serviced. It's in good shape, fluid's clean. Rest of the car, even though it's a Canadian car, it's been undercoated, doesn't really have rust on the body, very clean inside, very clean outside, really well kept and well taken care of. So this is should be part of your decision process. What's the rest of the car look like? Not how much is the bill to fix this is. Because if the rest of the car is too far gone, it's not worth it. But if the rest of the car is in excellent shape, and especially if you spend a lot of money, you maintain it and keep it good, then perhaps it is worth it. Terminal stuff, rust, transmission problems would have made me not recommend this customer do this job. But in this case, this car is in good shape, even though it has the rust and all this stuff on the bolts and whatnot, but the body itself is good. Bolts, you can fix, you can replace, drill out, whatnot, but the body, not exactly worth fixing. So that's how you come up with this thought process. This is an involved job. It could be DIY, but you still need to take your time, read the manual, Take your time. This is not a job to rush through. I've done a lot of these, and the time lines make, make us look like we're flying through it. But this was actually two full days of work, just to give you an idea. We started at 9 o'clock one day, and we were done done with the car 5 o'clock the following day. So this took two full days of drive with the cleaning and the driving and everything. So just keep that in mind. This is a long job any engine work is and with that we're getting really close to starting it up for the first time you'll hear the first start the prime first then the first start and you'll see the end of the video so let's do that all right the moment of truth is here we're all done we're about to prime it i have the crank position sensor disconnected without further ado we're going to prime this engine this is the actual first start until the oil light goes off. Oil light is off. Battery is not very happy, but I'm probably going to need to charge that. Plug in the crank position sensor. Now it should start. So let's see. All right. Usually, every time we start it at 2 AZ. After a rebuild, the, you feel them like hesitating for a minute. All the oil, all the cleaner that we used, all that has to burn off. And we have the exhaust going on this. Usually it will bellow smoke like you would not believe. Because remember when we were assembling everything, we put oil in the cylinders, all that has to burn off. And until it does, it won't run 100%. But see? So it's like you feel that uh, it's just not smooth yet. That is completely normal. We're gonna let this car run for probably an hour, just like it sits right now. Here goes the smoke from the exhaust. That is also normal. We're gonna let it run for an hour. We're gonna drain the oil again. Change the oil filter because if there's any debris left, we don't want it to go until the braking oil change that I already include these when I do these engines. 
That way, I give you the car 100% clean. After that, we're gonna do a full cleanup. We missed a few spots here that are still oily. We're gonna clean those. Test drive it, you know, do everything else. I still have to secure the uh, wire for the block heater, which is uh, sitting right here right now. I wanna tidy up. Fortunately, this car, the day before the customer brought it in to do this, he got on a little fender bender. Broke the bumper here, put a little dent in the lower radiator support. I don't think it's an issue because when I took that crossbar, it lined up pretty okay. It was like maybe a millimeter or two off. So it's radiator still free, it's not like jam. So I wouldn't think that's an issue. He still wants to fix it. That's he really takes care of this car. And just for reference, this is a Canadian car, however, it is registered in Illinois. Just for those that think this is a car that drove from Canada, no. But it was originally a Canadian model, kilometers on the speedometer and everything. And it was brought to Illinois and it was sold to this owner. It's running, it's already smoothed out. Running pretty good. Check engine light is probably on because we had the crank position sensor disconnected. Yeah, it is on. We'll have to reset that and make sure everything. Sometimes with these engines, when you start them, the chain will start clattering. In that case, we would have to move the tensioner manually one click. That is something common with these, but this one doesn't seem like it. We're gonna wait for it to warm up and make sure everything is good. But there you have it, folks. This is basically the repair. This engine no longer burns oil, and don't take my word for it. There's a lot of people that have had this repair done and followed it, and this is the important part, follow that repair with good maintenance habits, like oil changes every 5,000 miles, switch the oil, and this is the important thing, switch the oil to 5W30, don't use synthetic, if you wanna use synthetic, fine, but you don't have to in these engines, switch it to 530. You will use, you will lose like 0.2 of a miles per gallon, but this engine was designed for 5W30, and they decided to put 520, just to give it a little bit better gas mileage for emissions, that's not a good idea for this engine. 2A ZFE, 5W30, non-synthetic is fine. If you want to use synthetic, that's up to you, but it's not required for this engine. 5,000 miles, no more. And if you want to drop it to 4,000 miles, wouldn't hurt a thing. This engine, otherwise, will last a very, very long time because these are really good engines, folks. They just have this one thing. And when this engine first came out, 2002, in the Camry, it had head gasket issues and the heads, the bolts pulling off the block. This is an updated block. It does not have that issue anymore. But when they updated it, of course, they added another issue, which is the oil burning. This one is all fixed, all done. We're gonna get back to work here, wrap it up. But for you guys, thank you so much for watching the video. I hope you learned something new. If you like it, consider giving it a thumbs up. If you're not a subscriber, consider subscribing to the channel. Check out some other videos. And until the next video, folks, May the Lord bless you and keep you, and you have yourself a wonderful day.